Aloha and welcome to Condo Insider. Every Thursday from 3 to 3.30, we talk about issues affecting condo associations. More than 37% of our population lives in a condo, and this is our show to talk about hot topics. I do want to invite you at any time to call our hotline, 415-871-2474, if you want to ask a question. Today, we have with us a very good friend of mine, an expert in the mortgage business, specifically in the condo business as well, Laura Merrifield from Guild Mortgage, who's going to talk to us about issues for buying and selling a condo in, in, in a condo association. So welcome to the show, Laura. Hello. Tell us a little bit about you your, and your background. Um, let's see. I'm originally from California. I've been in Hawaii for the past, well, well over 20 years. I've been in the mortgage business for since 2008. And you work for Guild Mortgage. Mm -hmm. And who are they and what do they do? Are they a big company, little company? or? Well, big and little is subjective. But Guild Mortgage, uh, we've been around for the past 50 years. We have offices throughout the islands. We have offices throughout the mainland. So a lot, a lot of production. So you work for them and you're a mortgage broker. Mm -hmm. Would that be the right term? Yes. Okay, what, what is a mortgage broker? Are they licensed or you know, actually what does a mortgage broker do? I think the most important th thing that the mortgage broker does is that they get you the loan. So you can get into your new property or you can save money on your existing property. But we have the opportunity to use many different funding sources. So for example, at, we get to send loans to US Bank, to uh, Chase, to Mutual of Omaha. So we have a number of different funding sources and depending on the individual buyer, we just try to find the best fit for the buyer or the borrower. So you go to multiple banks in the mm -hmm. sense you have more than one resource and, and, and Guild itself is not a lender, it's not loaning the money or do they do that? Well, we have our own line that we use and we usually just sell to Fannie or Freddie and then we service to ourselves. I mean, we do the servicing. So, so people that do loans, a lot of my clients do what's called conventional loans. They will give us, you know, 20% down or 5% down, whatever it is. And I will do the loan through Guild Mortgage with Fannie and Freddie backing or one or the other. And so every month you'll get a bill from Guild Mortgage. So. And for people who don't know, we talk about Fannie and Freddie. It's an FHA mortgage, right? And that's just two. What is, what is Fannie and oh, Freddie? Oh, they're, so, they're all different. So Fannie and Freddie are conventional mortgages. FHA is... Uh, more government type of loan. So less down, you can do less down with that. There's more regulations. I know we're going to talk later on about the new bill that Obama just signed. So, so is FHA more like a guarantee of a, to another bank? I mean, or is FHA government, actually come, Government guaranteed. Guaranteed. So they're not coming mm -hmm. up with the money per se. They're just an FHA mortgage and using a traditional lender or, or a lender. Uh, and they're guaranteed in case something goes wrong and right. the mortgage goes in. Right. So we, into default. we we do all the guidelines and we underwrite the borrower based on FHA guidelines or based on Fannie guidelines or based on Freddie guidelines or based on portfolio guidelines. So there's 20 million different kinds of loans out there. <laughs> but basically, it's either going to be government, conventional, or portfolio. And government is FHA. So are, are there any 0% interest, zero point loans, and you don't have to pay back <laughs> until you die? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Not okay. Here. Okay. So how do you see the mortgage market right now? I mean, how do you generally characterize the, the market as a, in general terms? Uh, the mortgage market. So it's very busy. Interest rates are very low. There's a lot of people that are refinancing right now. They're pulling out cash. They're buying investment properties. There's a lot of people that are buying their first time homes because now they can afford it. So it, interest, rates are, interest rates are very low and people are taking advantage of that. So and I know this is hard to say because you're not a realtor, but in general terms, you see the market is hot. I mean, people are buying and there's, there's more demand than supply or is it vice versa? Them, in, in your opinion only. Is a, is a softening. How do you see the market? Okay, so we do a lot of sales, a lot of purchases for people. It's, yes, I'm not a realtor, but I can tell you that when we do a pre-approval for somebody, let's say John Smith wants to buy this condo, he's always in competition. There's always multiple offers, and the realtors are taking in multiple offers, and the sellers are choosing between, you know, five, six, seven different borrowers. So I, in that sense, I would say the real estate market is very hot right now. Yeah. 
Would you say those offers are exceeding the listing price or are they below the listing price? Majority of the time, we're going over listing price. Wow. Majority of the time. Well, and that's just maybe my clients, and it depends on what the price range is. Because if you're looking at, you know, maybe a three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar condo, majority of those are going over because it's a very hot area. Uh, uh, but you know, two million and three million, they might not be going over. They might be room for negotiation there. Is, is that true? Generally speaking, of new developer projects like Kakako, or is it? Kakako sold out. Really? <laughs> all the clients that I have that have bought have been in buildings that have all sold out. So I think there might be some available still. I don't know. Wow. I Why do you think that is? Just just Hawaii's hot and the money cheap is cheap, or what? Do you have enough feeling why it's so hot? You mean Kakako or Hawaii? Hawaii. I think Hawaii, because well, you live in Hawaii, don't you? Love it here? Never move. I know. I wouldn't leave, leave either. I love it here. I've been here for 20-something years, and I think the only way to make it is to own property. And so property values go up, but once you have the ability to buy, you know, 3% down or, you know, 0% down, there are places in EVA that you could, or if you have VA loan, there's 0% down. So once you have the money to buy, I think you've got to. And so the market has been going up, and it just stabilizes you. Well, let's approach this from two different points of view. Number one, if you have a buyer who wants to buy a condo, let's talk about like the condo itself and what kind of documents the, the, the lender's looking at as far as uh, to qualify that purchaser. And then let's talk then about some of the mortgage opportunities as far as the different products and mortgages. So focusing on the condo for a second, when a lender is looking at approving a buyer for a condo, besides personal credit, which I'm sure they're looking at, and, and, and what would you say the minimum credit score is today for, is there a minimum credit score? I think it's probably about 620. 620. Like, everybody has their thresholds. For us at Guild, it's 620. 620. Mm -hmm. And so when they aren't looking at the condo itself, the association, what is the lender typically looking at? If we're looking at the condo, it really depends. As an owner-occupant, you know, one of the big things that we're going to talk about is owner occupancy. How much, how many percent of the building is occupied by owners or second homeowners versus investors, right? As a lender, we like to lend in buildings that have over 51%, right? More owners, more second homes than there are tenants. So, but if you're buying as an owner occupant, so I'm going to live in this property, there's no owner occupancy ratio, right? But there are a couple of red flags. So you, there can't be any litigation, no construction litigation. There can't be more than 15, 20% commercial space. There can't be more than 15% delinquencies. So if you have any of those red flags, oh, one more, and no one entity can own more than 10% of the building. So if there's 100 units, 100 units, and somebody owns 11 of them, we're not going to lend in that building. So that wouldn't necessarily be true for a brand new project where the developer owns no. more than 10%, no. right? Because he's obviously trying to sell them right, all, and he, right. he may temporarily own 100% for right, that property. Right. So that, wouldn't, that, that rule wouldn't apply to uh, new construction with a developer, the 10% rule. Right, but when you're buying new construction, they always will tell you how much is sold to owner-occupants, how much is second home, and how much is investment. So Do people you, really know how much is owner-occupant and second home? Is it just they're going on the good faith of what they're told? Because I know as a management company, we had a hard time determining after a buyer bought it, what he did with it. He could say, I bought it for a second home, I let my family come there, you know, or uh, that type of thing. Or they, but they truly might be occasionally renting it out to somebody else. Do we really know? Or is it, how do they really know? I think it's hard to tell, but I think certain places, I think like in Maui, right, you have to fill out that questionnaire every year right. if you're renting it or if you're not renting it. And it has to do with taxes, you know, if you're going to pay your transit, transient tax. But the majority of the management companies that I've spoken to go by the property, ad the address of the billing. So if the address of the billing goes off-site, they're considering it an investment. If the address of the billing goes on-site, then they're considering it an owner-occupant. So we've had struggles where we've needed more second home owner-occupant ratio, and we've had to go to the property manager and ask them, okay, are all of these, you know, 50 units really truly investments, or is, is somebody's son or somebody's cousin or somebody living there part-time that's related? So explain the difference to me. I know that President Obama just signed a new bill 
that basically said for FHA mortgages is 30% owner occupant for an FHA mortgage. And you're saying 50.1 or majority 51% <laughs> have to be owner occupant. What's the difference? Okay, so the new law actually opens up a lot because I don't know if you realize this or not, but a lot of the buildings that used to be FHA approved fell off the FHA approved lift. They've, a lot of them have expired because you need that 51% and they couldn't do it because they were all, they might've been at 48% or 49% or 35%. And once you fall off, you, you've got to reapply with all of your documents to get FHA. Yeah. And one of the interesting things about that, this comes up all the time on the management side. In your opinion, do you think it's important that the association, the board of directors of the association, goes and requalifies with the FHA? Okay, so in my personal opinion, I have not been using the FHA loan. FHA was designed so that you could put minimal down, three and a half percent, and the government will guarantee it, right? We have other loan programs now that you could put down three percent, and you know the banks will guarantee it. So. When I have to, when I lay out FHA with another 3% loan in front of my clients, we've been going with just a straight 3% because they're not, there's not a lot of condos to, to choose from. The market is very small. You have to have a, a condo that's approved, that's an FHA approved condo to use the FHA program. If I just go straight 3% with a different conventional program, they can shop anywhere they want to. As long as they're going to owner occupy it, there's no owner occupancy ratio required at all. So that works for an owner occupant. Mm -hmm. If you were an investor, would that make you want to lean more towards FHA because of the theoretical issue of the 30 versus 50% owner occupancy? Well, okay, so I told you there's, 50, there's 20 million loan programs out there, but FHA is for owner occupants. So if we're gonna go investor, you're gonna have to go a different route anyways. Right. So, and the investors, you have to have 51% owner occupancy. Otherwise, the loan program is not efficient unless you're, you're going to it's much more expensive it's, yes it's very expensive it's very expensive so if you're going to buy as an investor in a condo you want to be prepared to put down 20 25 percent and you want to be prepared to only look at condos that have 51 percent owner occupancy so assuming you have good credit 620 or more and assuming well, you that, have that's that's marginal credit marginal credit. Uh -huh. good credit like excellent credit is 740 and above so if you have anything between 740 and 850, you're going to get the same interest rate. So anything above 740 is fine. Okay. Well, we're going to take a short break because okay. I got some really, <laughs> I got some really tough questions for you. But uh, we'll come back in one minute. Uh, thank you for watching uh, Condo Insider. Hey everybody, my name is David Chang, and I am the new host of the show. The Art of Thinking Smart. I'm really excited to be able to give you the smart edge in all aspects of your life. You can have awesome guests, some of my great mentors in the business, military, political, nonprofit, you name it. So we look forward to seeing you every other Thursday at 10 a.m. on Think Tech Hawaii and also on my blog, artofthinkingsmart.com. Look forward to seeing you there. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with The Economy and You, and I'd like to invite you each week to come watch my show each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're talking with Laura Merrifield of Guild Mortgage about the challenges for condo association buyers and sellers and selling their unit and getting a mortgage and the issues that it affects to, uh, associations. So as we were talking, we were talking about qualifying a person for a mortgage and the lender looks at certain aspects of the association itself. And you mentioned, for example, that they um, have to be 50% owner occupied for a conventional mortgage. They need 20 to 25 percent down, and and uh, I called it good credit. You said that's fair credit, but let's just say they have to have fair credit or better to, <laughs> to get the loan. What do they look for with regard to the budget, the association's budget, its reserve study? How does the lender look at that aspect of the of you know, approving an association or a buyer 
uh, by looking at the project itself. So there's, there's two different kinds of approvals that they do. And again, if you're buying as a second home or you're buying as an owner-occupant, they can do what's called a streamline review. They ask some basic questions and that's it. You know, what's the owner-occupancy ratio? But again, it doesn't matter if it's 51% or if it's 3%. If an owner-occupant is buying it, it doesn't matter. Um, they'll ask about litigation. If there's litigation, they'll ask about how many people, how many entity, is there any entity that owns more than 10% of the building? Um, and, and then commercial space and delinquencies. Is there more than 15% delinquencies? So if we can pass just the basic questions, that, then it'll get approved. But when we're talking about um, approvals for a full approval for an investor, then they're going to look at the budget. Then they're going to look through the minutes. Then they're going to look. They're going to do a deeper look into the project because the project because it's going to be owned by an investor, and we want to make sure that the condominium can withstand the test of time. Because as a buyer, right? They, the thought process is, as a buyer, if I own two homes, an investment home and a personal home where I live in, if something goes wrong with my personal life, I'm going to stop paying on this investment property. And if I stop paying the bank, I'm going to probably stop paying my maintenance fees. Can the association as a whole keep turning the lights on, pay the insurance, pay the security guards, all of that stuff that it needs to do if it has... And how does the reserve event? study itself? I mean, there's been discussions about... Uh, under these types of mortgages, there's some minimum contribution to reserves that we made, like 10%. Is that true? And, and talk a bit more about that. That's, that's been a big thorn in a lot of people's sides because I think in Hawaii, we have special laws. We have a lot of condominiums compared to, say, Texas, right, where they have lots more single-family homes. So um, the way FHA works is you must put 10% into the reserves every year. So if you bring in a million dollars, you know, you have to put aside $100,000 towards, you know, the upkeep of the elevators, the upkeep of the, you know, the windows and the grounds and all of the things that you need to do all the time to, to maintain the building. Is that kind of set in stone? I mean, in the sense, uh, you know, having a reserve specialist designation and probably understanding that more than I need to, you could make an argument in association because they have huge amounts of money doesn't need to put 10% in because they've been very diligent and had good success in the past. Is that like set in concrete? Or, or if you had a good story to tell about why you're still fully funded for your reserves, that uh, you, would, you should be qualified. Okay, so let's go back to there's 20 million different loan programs. So some of them, it's going to be fine. But FHA, I've never had an exception. When we send the package in, the whole package has to go into FHA and it goes to California and they take, you know, three, four weeks to approve it. When we've had less than 10% going in, it's been denied. And so it's been a matter of having the board meet again and redo the budget. And <clears throat> I do want to give you a fair warning because if we have enough time at the end of the show, I'm going to ask you to list the 20 million different types of work. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot. Yeah. But FHA, I've never seen an exception on owner occupancy. How about delinquencies? Or budget. Are they looking at your one-day delinquent? Or is it over 30 days? Or, or uh, what is the del is there a threshold on delinquency? It's 30 day. It's 30. I, I mean, see, I'm not an attorney, and I don't have it memorized, but I believe it's it's either 30 or 60 day delinquencies, and it's if it's more than 15 percent of, of the that, total. Of the total. Right. Because mm -hmm. I could tell you from a practical experience, you have people who could pay theoretically one day late. Right. So they have a $10 late fee on their ledger. So when you run the report at the end of the month, the pure numbers of how many people at that moment in time have a delinquency might be higher. But when you add up maybe 10 or 15 people, it's not more than $100 on late fees. You know, I, I would assume they're using some common sense when they're looking at this to, uh, and not just going off a statistical number. That's the number. Well, that's really... If, it, if it's bigger than the 15% and we have to dig deeper into it, then that becomes an issue with the lender and the property manager. Right. Right? Because how are they reporting it? Is it 15% of the owners? You know, it, are they waiting? Are they looking at the 60-day timetable? Or what are they looking at? Because sometimes they, it's just a matter of when they run the report. Yeah, well, I, I can just say from experience that the, you know, management companies are handling thousands of transactions electronically. And so you can have a moment you run that report and they just, the, the, the grace period's just ended. And so you have 
10 or 20 people with 10 bucks or $25, depending on what the late fee is on the report, where in reality there's only two or three of the whole project that have a consistent delinquency <laughs> of the maintenance fees. And so uh, normally when you run the report, you get the report and it is what it is. But I would assume a lender is purging that out to some degree to look at that and, and uh, trying to put some common sense to it that the real delinquencies are really these three units out of a hundred and these other things were just administrative charges. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Most management companies won't even deal with adjusting that late fee for a couple of months until they see how it sorts out, you know, because what happens is the owner paid the maintenance fee a day or two late, then they get the bill with the, the prior month's $25 right, right, late right, right, fee. Right. And so it follows like 60 days, you know, and, right, right. and of course then you have the owner who called and said, uh, my dog died, I had to go to the, bury him in Tucson, Arizona, and I forgot about my maintenance fee, and I have a good record, I've never missed before, I want you to waive it, and, and most management companies will do that as a courtesy, because late fees aren't really designed to penalize people, but associations are zero-based budget. They have to have their fees paid so they can pay electricity, pay the gardener, pay the insurance, and so they don't really have the latitude of letting people be delinquent, you know, with respect to that. On the litigation side, is there some review of that to the extent you could have litigation from an own homeowner just saying that uh, they don't like a particular rule in the house rules mm -hmm. versus because the somebody wanted a dog yeah. and they got, the dog got so many tickets yeah. and so they yeah see. so you get, you get some quote litigation on those types of minor issues versus what I would consider major like a uh, construction defect or uh, the guy who fixed the spalling did a bad job, you know, something that has more meat to it, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Do they look at that kind of that way? Of or course, the, or, or, of course, or? of course. So it's always a question, is there any litigation on the project? It's on that R0105C. And if the answer is yes, we always get a copy of the complaint. It could be a civil complaint, which we won't be able to get a copy of, but that doesn't affect lendability. Right? It could be, but if it's a construction defect, if it's something that has to do with structural health and safety, then it, it could be a problem. So we need a copy of it. We need to know if it's in mediation already, if it's in arbitration, what's happening with it, will the insurance cover it? If it's found to be the association's issue, will the insurance cover it? So it's a flag, but it doesn't mean it's a kiss of death. It right, it right. Could so be it's a red flag. It's going to be something that you have to be able to. Uh, rationalize and justify mm -hmm. but, properly. But you have to think as a buyer, right? You're a buyer, you're going to buy into this unit, and in the association there is a construction defect. Something's wrong with the windows, let's say, right? You're suing the developer right now. You can buy, the insurance is going to take care of the, uh, a good portion of it, but if, if we lose, if the association loses and the, they have to pay for all the fixing, what's going to happen to the maintenance fees? If it was already at 600 and it has to go up, can you as a buyer afford to pay 700 or 800 or 900 dollars because you lost the litigation? So let me give you an uh, example, okay. uh, kind of based on fact, but I'll round everything off. So there's a condo association mm -hmm. and you want to buy it, you're an owner occupant. Mm -hmm. And the reserve study reflects that they have to replace all their cast iron pipes and they have to assess the owners $12 million of the whole, all mm -hmm. 300 owners. Mm -hmm. And so the maintenance fees are going to go up from $600 to $1,000 a mm -hmm. month. And that's all disclosed. Mm -hmm. Is that the kiss of death? Or if, nope, if not they, at all. Not at all. If you can, or if I, I'm the borrower, if I can afford the increase in maintenance fees, it's fine. The, I just have to count the liability. So and that's so, not... Taking that exact same example, but uh -huh. twisting it one little bit. Okay. Let's just say the reserve study showed the $12 million needed for the cast iron pipes, but there is no assessment, there is no funding mechanism. It just shows them in the hole uh -huh. that they don't have the $12 million to repair the building. Then that's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem. That's gonna, when the underwriter looks through the budget and says, we are short, then it's going to, and then also we're looking at the minutes. So it's going to be in the minutes where, you know, we're short. How are we going to fix the elevator? We don't, if one goes down, we only have one, right? What's going to happen right. in an emergency? So all these things are going to be in the minutes already. So the buyer's going to see that and the underwriter's going to see that. And what's going to be the solution? How are we going to fix this financially? Is it going to be everyone's going to be assessed 50000 Is Is the condominium going to take out a loan so that, the, but all of the owners only have to pay back that loan, or does each person have to come up with their 50000 Because that's going to be very It'll difficult. It'll be a big impact. Most mm -hmm. associations will give them a choice to pay 
to quote the 50,000 up front, which is before interest, present value, so that the people who have the money don't have to pay the interest. Mm -hmm. And they'll give uh, the alternative to the owners who can't to pay a monthly assessment based on association borrowing. And that way people can keep their homes and the one who need the cash flow to pay it over time can do that. And, but the ones who have the cash can pay their share and, and not be uh, having to pay the interest on something. So most of it, most boards I know try to give the opportunity for both ways, people, people to handle the, the assessment. But, but I guess as a buyer coming in though, if I'm coming into this new situation where you have two choices, to take the loan with the association or pay it in cash, as a lender, I have to know that the buyer can handle it either way. Right. So it has to be documented. If it's not documented and I don't know what that monthly fee is going to be or that lump sum is going to be, then it, we can't lend to that person. Yeah. More times than not, I see that uh, in that situation, the buyer puts in his DROA, I want my present value paid off, and it comes out of the equity that the seller has within mm -hmm. the unit. Not always the case, but uh, predominantly that's kind of how it works. Mm -hmm. So where do you think the mortgage market is going? I mean, it's been, I don't want to call it flat, but it's been fairly low, uh, up and down a little bit uh, for the last couple of years, in my opinion. So where do you, how do you see the rates right now and where it's going to go? And uh, I know you can't guarantee it, but you're in the business. So you must have a feeling about it, you know? Well, so I, I think that the interest rates are at all-time lows. I think that if you buy a house or if you're borrowing money right now, it's a great time. And it might be like this for another three months, six months, a year. I, I don't know. I, everyone's warning. Like today, I got a big alert on my email saying, you know, lock all of your borrowers. Tomorrow's a big, you know, federal speech, and Yellen's going to come out. Who knows what she's going to say? Interest rates could go up, right? But they've been threatening interest rates going up for the past since 2016, October 2000. No, we're 16. October 2014. They've been saying they're going to go up, and they've just been going like this. I would say, correct me if I'm wrong, the rates for the last year or two have gone up. A little up bit. A, yeah, up a, a half bit. point, down a half a right. point, up a quarter point, down. It's been, I mean, I actually, when I look at the uh, newspaper and I read this great headline, mortgage rates rise, and I see it went from seven and a half to uh, seven and, you know, five eighths or whatever it was, or, or I should say three and five eighths, from <laughs> three and a half to three and five eighths. Right, right, right. You know, it's like a quarter mortgage of a point. rates, or an eighth of a point, it's gone up mm -hmm. some nominal number mm -hmm. that I think most consumers at that level don't really put much to it, you know. Yeah, but it's still scary. Everyone wants, everyone wants to buy when everything's at the lowest, the lowest interest rate, you know, they want to get the best deal on the house, and you don't even know that until after rates have gone up, when you're so, looking So down. your general advice is act now, because you don't know yes. what the future is going to be, and right. for years there's been pressure on this, and yes. whatever it may be. It's, I, I'm, I'm sure the rates are going to go up, it's just a matter of when. And you I don't, don't want, want my stuck. rates to go up. <laughs> you, you, you don't everybody want else's <laughs> rates can go up, but my <laughs> rates can't go up. But anyway, I want to thank you for being on Condo Insider and sharing this with you. Today we've had Laura Merrifield here from Guild Mortgage talking about the mortgage market and the importance of condo associations making sure they have their financial act together so people can buy and sell on their property. And of course, the board has an obligation to protect the property. So again, we're on every Thursday from 3 to 3.30. And thank you for watching Condo Insider. And thank you, Laura, for appearing today. Welcome. Mahalo.